Good morning and welcome to this month's Downtown Aviation and Redevelopment Subcommittee. My name is Daniel Valenzuela. I'm honored to chair this subcommittee and uh, to be joined by my colleagues, Councilwoman Felda Williams, Councilwoman Kate Gallego, and we'll be joined uh, sh uh, in just a few minutes by Councilman Bill Gates. Uh, the first item uh, on the agenda is a call to, or uh, call to order. We've done that. We begin each meeting, we end each meeting with the call to the public. It's just a reminder that the public has the first and last word. And of course, like every other subcommittee and meeting that we have here at the City of Phoenix, uh, members from the community are, are welcome to fill out a card and speak on any item that they uh, would like to speak on. Uh, the next item here is the approval of the February 4th, 2015 minutes. So we have a motion. Move approval. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay. Items four through seven are information and discussion. Uh, for the last several uh, months, we have uh, put on this subcommittee, we put the FAA uh, item on the agenda. We want to be sure that the public has, you know, though all of these uh, meetings are, are out there between the FAA and and the airport, uh, we want to be sure that the public has another opportunity to be heard, uh, and we do that in this subcommittee as well. So that said, item four is the FAA changes in aircraft departure procedure update. We have Tammy Fisher with us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm Tammy Fisher, Acting Aviation Director. Yeah. I am on. <laughs> thank you. Uh, as you know, uh, the airport has received um, last count uh, more than 4,500 complaints from over 800 households uh, regarding the news, the new flight paths that were implemented by the FAA back in September. And since that time, as you know, with the direction of the mayor and council, aviation staff has been acutely focused on this issue um, and with the goal of uh, achieving relief for the community from the impacts of noise. Uh, and their quality of life over the past uh, several months, almost six months now. Um, we will continue to provide this subcommittee and the council with the updates on our community engagement, our FAA, work with the FAA, and also our legislative strategy. Our next um, set of community meetings will be um, happening in March. We have just posted on our website and also have coordinated with the council a next series of community meetings. Uh, the point of these meetings is really to uh, follow up with the community with a recap of our uh, first series of community meetings that were held in January um, and share information that's been obtained from the noise monitoring. Um, and also to continue to just make ourselves available for the community to answer questions and provide information as needed. These community meetings are not beneficial for every member of the community, but they do seem to be um, helpful and, and wanted by other members of the community. So we will continue uh, to make ourselves available to provide information um, to the community. Uh, we expect that the uh, report of the first, the full report, we've had a summary on our website of the first set of community meetings, but we have a very large report uh, that is a more detailed uh, accounting of the January meetings that we'll be posting on our website um, yet this week. And we continue to communicate with the community through uh, social media. Um, I, I personally have uh, signed on to Nextdoor now and I have been getting updates um, as, a, as a member of my neighborhood as the airport is posting uh, information on our website and, and letting me know that it's there. And we also, for these community meetings, we'll be doing direct mailings, um, hopefully uh, counting on our council members to put the information out in newsletters so that everyone can be aware uh, that they're coming. Our legal protest has also been posted on our website and also the city council policy presentation, even though that we have video posted, um, some members of the community have asked for copies of the presentation and so we've made that available on the website. We're also busy working on a tool that I hope will be very helpful uh, for residents to monitor um, and, and identify deviations um, of the actual flight tracks. Um, the community members have been calling the aviation department and asking questions about specific flight uh, tracks 
and we ha are, are always happy to provide that information and prepare maps. But this tool is really a web-based application that would give the public uh, the ability to go in and query in real time or historic uh, information about specific flights and where they're going, what their um, altitude is, what uh, the destination of the aircraft is, and so forth. Um, we hope that we've heard from the public that the FAA uh, controllers continue to allow aircraft to deviate from the flight paths um, as designed, um, and we have been able to verify that that is occurring. Uh, we continue to report that to the FAA that uh, these, uh, these um, flights are turning early, uh, particularly at the downtown area, and working with them to try to uh, mitigate that uh, flight activity. But this tool will allow the public to see this type of information uh, for themselves and report a complaint directly. Uh, we're testing the application now, and we hope to have that available for residents in late March, early April. As you know, the FAA Working Group has been assembled. Uh, former Congressman Ed Pastor has been uh, appointed to represent the city, and he is supported by uh, our Assistant Aviation Director, Chad Makovsky, and a airspace technical consultant from Landerman Brown named Tom Cornell. Uh, they have met twice. Uh, the first session was a listening session, and I do appreciate uh, members of the City Council uh, coming to that listening session to present our, our case and um, our perspective on what the problem is to be solved. Also, the city's historic preservation officer uh, spoke to the group at their first meeting. Uh, the second meeting was more about scope, um, what would be the scope of the work for the working group, and uh, the FAA agreed uh, to look at the Grand Avenue corridor as well as the Levine area, which was consistent with the direction received from the council back in December. Um, and staff has asked that they specifically look at, uh, based on the council's direction to go back to the prior flight paths, that for these two corridors that they look at the prior geography of the flight path before September 18th using the new technology and, and get back to us on whether or not that's a viable alternative or a solution to the problem. The next meeting will be the week of March 9th. Uh, we thought it was March 9th and then March 12th, and so we're working on calendars to try to get the group uh, reassembled at some point during that uh, week, and we expect to hear back from the FAA uh, their review of alternatives for the Grand Avenue and Levine flight paths. We also continue to work on our legislative strategy. Um, our DC representative will be working with the Arizona delegation uh, to develop alternatives um, for the FAA reauthorization bill. Um, as I mentioned at the policy meeting last week, we would like for the provision uh, for a legislative CADEX to be removed from public law 112-95 that um, allows the FAA to make significant changes without public uh, collaboration. Uh, also, uh, there is a uh, provision in Public Law 112.95 that uh, that prohibits the FAA or encourages the FAA to look at different uh, flight paths, not overlay old flight paths with the new technology. Um, if we are unable to uh, successfully achieve uh, new legislation that would prevent uh, the CADAC, legislative CADEX and the route overlay prohibition, um, then we'd like to add language that. Um, that requires the FAA to do public notification and outreach when they're making significant change to the flight paths. Uh, Assistant Aviation Director Chad Makovsky is in DC right now uh, meeting with our industry uh, uh, organizations, uh, American Association of Airport Executives, uh, Airports Council International, and US Travel, as well as meetings with um, Senator Flake and McCain's um, offices and Today and tomorrow, uh, they'll be meeting with uh, representatives uh, Gosar, Salmon, and Franks. Also, uh, Congressman Ruben Gallego has joined the Quiet Skies Caucus, and we do appreciate that. Um, we are also um, scheduling meetings um, for the members of the council who will be going to the National League of Cities um, next week, I believe. And um, our uh, State Historic Preservation Officer here in uh, Arizona has also been uh, to DC to meet personally with the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. And I mentioned our industry collaboration. 
Uh, we are developing an industry position. Um, AAAE, American Association of Airport Executives, has agreed to author a letter that would be jointly signed by uh, Airports Council International and hopefully U.S. Travel. Uh, we are working on industry support for legislative action, uh, telling the Phoenix story, which is unique. Uh, Phoenix was, uh, in fact, handled differently than any other city where these new procedures have been implemented. Uh, but we are interested in identifying other airports who may have a future interest in making sure that uh, they are not a victim of the same uh, course of action. Um, AAAE's draft action plan uh, should be completed in the next 30 to 45 days. And uh, within a week, they intend to hold a leadership conference uh, to talk about the issue specific to Phoenix with other uh, airports and industry partners. Next steps, as I mentioned, uh, March uh, community meetings have been scheduled and we are preparing for that, uh, getting the flight monitoring tool uh, up and running and available to the public and uh, continued participation in the FAA working group and uh, of course our legislative strategy. We again acknowledge and want to emphasize that we clearly understand the impact that these new flight procedures have had on the community and we continue to dedicate a tremendous amount of time um, and resources uh, to stay focused on this topic and achieve uh, a mutually beneficial solution working with the FAA and our uh, technical resources and community members um, to bring about change. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you so much. I have three cards. If it's okay with my colleagues, we'll just go right to the cards. Uh, Dale Taylor. Mark, Mr. Taylor, will each speaker will have uh, two minutes. Uh, yes, my name is Dale Taylor. This working better? Yep, you're on. Dale Taylor, I live at uh, 2116 West Windsor. Uh, the nearest large uh, intersection is uh, 19th Avenue and Thomas Road. And we are sort of on the west fringes of the uh, flight path that uh, is supposed to be flying over the Grand Avenue exit route. And uh, according to all of the information that was given, the flights that are coming over our home and even further to the east of us are experiencing a tremendous amount of overflights. Uh, if you were to uh, stand in the front yard of our home or in the street, uh, you cannot carry on a conversation when these airplanes are coming over. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the uh, number of flights, it's within every two minutes for about four hours at a crack, starting at 6 o'clock in the morning up until about 11, and then starts again after noon and uh, goes until about 3 or so, and then after that it starts again. So it's almost a 24-hour operation of flights every two minutes. Uh, and like last night, we had a number of flights come over at uh, 12.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, which uh, again woke me because we have a, a little orchestra going over there with the railroad and they're honking their horns and then the aircraft coming over uh, directly over the home and they vary in altitude and aircraft style. So uh, those uh, issues are a big part of our neighborhood. That's my end. That's it. No, you can keep. Uh, you oh. want to finish your thought, Mr. Um, Mr. Taylor? The uh, other uh, issues that uh, a number of us have asked is now with all this heavy aircraft uh, flying over our community now, what's it going to be like in five years? Uh, we haven't had that question answered. And uh, several people have uh, inquired as to uh, whether or not the city will go into a lawsuit against the FAA if they don't uh, uh, make some sort of a change on this. Um, 
the community meetings that we've had, um, I've attended all of those that uh, were in the area, including uh, West High School. And uh, quite frankly, it was sort of a setup because before the meeting even started, they said, we've heard about the noise, there's nothing we can do about it. And then they continued on with inviting us to break into little groups so that we really didn't get uh, a full opinion from all of the people that attended. So that was a disappointment for a number of us. Uh, the other thing was, uh, are the monitors already up for monitoring the aircraft noise? Bless. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, yes, the monitors were put in place in early February. Uh, there were, uh, I think, a total of 35, 37 locations, yes. and they, the monitoring uh, was completed uh, within that time mm -hmm. frame, and that data is now with our consultant who's uh, analyzing that data and compiling it to produce their report. We were curious because none of us in our area Mr. Taylor, saw I'm any activity okay. with those. We haven't seen anything, so who, who would we contact to see the locations of those? Mr. Chair, those locations are posted on our website. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for coming out and continuing to uh, stay engaged. Next speaker, Ginger Maddox. Subcommittee members, my name is Ginger Maddox. I'm a resident of FQ Story and the uh, self-proclaimed researcher. Um, there has been a bit of confusion in the public regarding the appropriation bill writer, and I would, uh, there has been a posting on the website of aviation as to uh, the fact that this is a directive, and I believe that March 14th is the date that the FAA is supposed to report to Congress, so I would encourage Congressman Gallego to make sure that that happens and report back to the public as to what the FAA had to say. Um, next, as um, the researcher, I came across um, a piece in Order 1050.1E, Change 1, that I believe is the best opportunity that at least the historic districts have for making changes to the flight path. And I have uh, a document here that I can give as to where the location is in the, um, the FAA government library. But basically, in Section 11, which is historic, architectural, archaeological, and cultural resources, 11.5a through 11.5d. To me, the most interesting section is an 11.5b number three, which reads, and this is very short, <laughs> Discovery after project approval or after construction has begun on an approved project, which is what has happened to us. If the FAA has approved an undertaking and construction has begun and then discovers historic properties or unanticipated effects on historic properties, the FAA must determine what actions can be taken to resolve any adverse effects. So this is already a procedure that they are required to follow. There are seven sections that, and historic properties are just one of them. So I believe because Levine is a preserve, that there is also similar language that could affect the Levine area. So I would like to present my paperwork and you can follow up on that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and the uh, final card, uh, Brent Kleiman marked, uh, speak if necessary. You okay, Mr. Kleiman? So the points have been made? Okay. I'll uh, turn this over to my colleagues. Councilwoman. Thank you. I had the opportunity to meet with the working group and talk to them about the sleep impacts and share some of the stories people have shared with us about if you already have a health condition and you can't sleep, how it really does impact your life. And the working group members nodded at the right time, so at least gave me a little bit of hope for relief. Uh, Councilwoman Pastor and I will be meeting with Senator McCain next week, and we want to thank Jim Waring for setting up that meeting so that we can make sure all of our team in D.C. is fully aware of the impact of this and hopefully move forward to a good solution. Um, 
One of the things that we have been getting more and more questions about is what does it mean when the FAA says we're doing this for safety? And I think there's a lot of confusion about altitudes with departures and arrivals. And I wish I, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this in advance because that visual aid is enormously helpful. But could you give us a little bit of a information on, on that particular issue? Um, Mr. Chair, Councilwoman Gallego, the, your question is about specifically how do the new procedures improve safety? Well, uh, I, what they've been, I, my understanding is one of the reasons they won't go back is related to altitudes and departures and arrivals and. Right. So if you can imagine a, a, an entire network, and you're right, the visuals would be very helpful. Um, our, I, I'm all alone today, if you notice. Our, <laughs> we are, our, I, we I are have, glad Chad is no, off fighting the good fight, but we missed him. I have no technical experts here to save me. Um, but our consultant does have some pretty good uh, 3D-like drawings that show the coordination of arrivals and departures. Um, the only um, visual description I can give you is a big freeway interchange where on-ramps and off-ramps are, you can see the coordination of the geometry. Uh, that happens you know, in the air with aircraft um, in a way that we can't see. Uh, as they are operating, but there is a tremendous network of aircraft traffic uh, occurring in the sky that has to be coordinated. Uh, another community member has referred to it as a 3D puzzle in the sky. And so I think what we were told by the FAA and specifically the FAA administrator is that undoing, going back to that would, would cause all that coordination um, with the new technology, because of course, before that was happening with land-based technology. Um, I think what I heard him say is that they would be um, casting away the benefits, all the benefits, the safety benefits, the environmental benefits, and the efficiency benefits of the next gen entire network to solve a problem um, in, in specifically one area. So I am not sure I have the technical expertise to tell you what would be unsafe about going back to the old procedures. Um, I know the benefits of the new system would be lost for a long period of time while they evaluate um, the alternative of going back and go through the necessary steps that we talked about at policy <laughs> last week in order to implement that change even just to go back to the old uh, procedures would uh, cause them to have to go through all those steps to yeah. ensure safety. Mm -hmm. I, don't I think trying to solve this in partnership with the community, and so I just want to make sure we talk about all of these issues publicly so people have the information that's here. So if hopefully we won't have to continue this conversation, but I have a feeling we, we may, and so maybe if we could do a visual aid at the next meeting and share that information because we're getting a lot of questions like, what do they mean by safety? Thank you. Thank you. Any other councilman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for all your hard work on this, Tammy. And again, appreciate all the folks from the community who continue to follow this closely. And um, uh, so I, I had to travel last week and I flew out that direction and um, it seemed I was obviously paying very close attention to the to the route, and it seemed kind of as we came over the Encanto area, it almost felt like the engines were revved. I'm not a you know, not an expert in aviation, but it almost I kind of experienced that. I don't know if there have been any reports of that or if that's part of the complaints, but it literally seemed like they they were sort of uh, trying to uh, go up an altitude by hitting the engines right when they were over the historic area any any thoughts or reports on that or kind of we haven't really discussed that issue of of you know it's one thing to be over it but it's another to be revving the engines so any any thoughts on that uh, uh, mr. chair uh, councilman Gates uh, very few intelligent thoughts about that um, as I am not an airspace expert but I do know that during the uh, initial few miles of the takeoff um, there is thrust that is required to gain altitude and um, that those conditions change as a turn occurs and um, there has been d discussion about are there different ways that the pilot can operate the aircraft to mitigate that 
Um, and I think that is what was um, uh, suggested by the FAA in our early discussions with them about are there different ways that the pilot can operate the aircraft to get a different result in terms of noise at that point in their flight over the historic neighborhoods. Um, I know there are concerns about safety implications of climbing faster um, or um, flying at slower speeds so that um, it's less noisy. Um, and so the technical uh, stakeholders that are around the table in this working group that the FAA has convened would be able to evaluate uh, those options and work with the airline partners to uh, get their agreement to operate in a way, uh, if that is possible and safe, that might change that noise condition at that particular moment um, in the flight. Okay, well, uh, you know, initially I was approached several months ago by a group of neighborhood leaders, some are in this room, and uh, like my colleagues, immediately uh, did some research, met with, with our city staff, our air aviation staff, and sent letters to the federal delegation and uh, thought that it would be a good idea for the dialogue that's happening now to put make this a standing item on this subcommittee because it's important that we all are caught up with the latest information that we are hearing from uh, the people who live in these neighborhoods. And I know the frustration is still there. Uh, and you know, I, I too believe that this is gonna be a, a conversation that's gonna have to continue obviously. Uh, but I, I do, I'm optimistic. I, I feel like, you know, we're not hearing the same things over and over, which is, which is refreshing. Mm -hmm. I do want to thank Congressman uh, Ed Pastor, former Congressman Ed Pastor, for uh, accepting his new role and helping us through this. Of course, Congressman Gallego is, is back in D.C. and clearly uh, inserting himself uh, and helping out there uh, as we speak. I also want to thank our aviation staff. You know, you, Tammy, and, and you know, Chad, who you've uh, directed out to, to be in D.C. right now uh, working through this. I'll also be in D.C. next week. We'll be working on this, uh, this item as well. So, so that said, you know, for those that are watching and those that are here, this item will be on next month's subcommittee as well. So hopefully uh, we'll, have, we'll have more information to, to share. Again, so far, it's been different information updated information every time. So I think this has been a good idea. And this idea actually comes from the neighborhood leaders who, uh, who I met with initially. So this was not my uh, great idea. This was an idea that coming directly from uh, the neighborhood leaders. So thank you for, for suggesting this uh, as a collective. Okay, we will uh, move on to item five, which is the airport concession street pricing policy. This item is for information and discussion. It's not scheduled for action. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, coming to the table here with me now is uh, Ms. Irene Larkin, who is the Acting Assistant Aviation Director uh, responsible for business, our business relationships um, with airport tenants for concessions as well as uh, finance and technology, and Ms. Roxanne Fabers, who is our Deputy Director of Business and Properties. And we're here today to talk about the airport's uh, street pricing policy, uh, which really um, began in the early 90s when, as a response to customer complaints that they felt that they were being uh, taken advantage of in the airport concessions environment. Um, a lot has changed uh, since the early 90s in airport operations. Uh, the type of concessions we have, the type of operations, new contracts uh, that are implemented. And so uh, we have recently, uh, just within the past five years, uh, implemented a major new contracts with our food and beverage program. Um, that program has been completed, and so we've had the opportunity to evaluate the, the performance of that program uh, in, in relation to this issue. And we are preparing to issue a next a major concessions contract for uh, retail concessions in Terminal 4. So we wanted to come and uh, just make a presentation today about what street pricing is, why we do it, how we do it, and issues to consider uh, if we want to um, revisit this policy for the airport uh, for the next contract coming forward. And so with that, I'd like to hand it off uh, to Ms. Favors to make the presentation. 
Um, thank you, Director uh, Fisher. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss our airport concession policy. As uh, Ms. Fisher indicated, um, historically airports did not have a street pricing policy. The um, operators were allowed to set prices, uh, whatever they wanted to charge, without a standardized pricing structure. As she indicated, customers did feel and believe that they were being gouged and overcharged. Street pricing came about in 1992 with Pittsburgh Airport. It started really as a result of a concession uh, developer. It was not airport driven. The developer wanted all of their operators to charge no more than street pricing. So the policy required pricing for the products and the services at the airport location to be comparable to local off airport locations. Um, soon after, other airports began to establish street pricing policies when, their ne when they issued their new concession contracts. Um, street pricing in various forms has become the industry standard. Phoenix first implemented their street pricing in 1996, and that began with the Terminal 3 concessions RFP. And over the last 18 years, we've implemented the policy to all terminal concessions, with the last one being the Terminal 4 food and beverage. So why do we do it? It improves customer satisfaction. According to our recent customer survey that was done in 2003, price continues to be the number one factor influencing purchasing decisions for all travelers, including business travelers. Street pricing policy improves the customer satisfaction as it increases customer confidence in the value of their decision to purchase. Passengers may spend more knowing that they're not being gouged. Street pricing also maintains consistency in the quality of the products and the services offered. Customers' confidence increases with knowing the quality and size of the products are familiar with their shopping experiences at off-airport locations. It is this familiarity with the shopping experience at the malls and downtown shops. It is this brand expectation in the quality, of, uh, quality the service level, and the pricing. And it is the portion size providing that certainty in the value of their purchases. Street pricing policy reinforces their customer expectations. So how do we do it? We achieve this through a collaborative business model, both at the RFP and the contract award. The airport, we establish program goals. We want to focus on customer satisfaction while achieving optimal sales and revenue. From our program goals, these are reflected in our business terms. We develop effective business terms to create a competitive and positive result, not only for the customer, but for the operator and the airport. This creates a win for all involved. The airport, prior to an RFP being released, determines the, the concession rental rates, and we do this to accommodate the street pricing. When an airport does not seek to maximize the rental rates, the result is a value for the customer through the street pricing, a reasonable profit for the concession operator, and reasonable revenue to the city. We implement street pricing with new contracts. This is done through our RFP document, which details in detail the street pricing policy and other terms so the operator can create a solid financial performa before their proposal is submitted. So how do we compare airport to street? There are differences. The airport average sales per square foot are higher than the street, street sales. In Terminal 4 food and beverage, the sales are over $1,000 per square foot. In comparison to an average street sales, it's approximately $300 to $500 per square foot. The competition for the customer is different. At a street location, customers have the ability to get exactly what they want. So here, if they don't want to go to Chipotle and they want a Chick-fil-A, they can get in their car and go to Chick-fil-A. But at the airport, the customers are a captive audience. This is um, especially true on our concourses. Once you pass security, there are limited choices. Street locations also um, have rents that don't have to include Ms. advertising. Harris, we have, we have one. I, I, I have a question for you. You're, you're comparing the, the prices and you just compared it to a local, but can you tell me what the rents are on some of these businesses compared to the airport? Because the airport's very expensive to operate in, not only the build out, but the continual um, agreement that you have. And I, I question the comparison there. Um, um, Mr. Chair, Madam um, Councilman Williams, the street location rents are different. They don't have to include things like the advertising and promotional fees. They have the ability in the street locations to actually get a tenant allowance from the landlord so that it helps them do their build out. So 
although our rents are higher at the airport, the availability of the traffic flow is almost guaranteed with passenger traffic. So they have the ability to make higher sales to cover that rent that we charge at the airport. Mr. Chair, Councilwoman Williams, what we're trying to point out here is just the differences to consider in comparing a street location to an airport location. And yes, the rents are different. The uh, potential for sales is different and the competition for the customer is different. So that, that's the point that we're trying to make with this slide. Okay. We realize that the revenue potential is greater at the airport. Um, also realizing that the retail purchases at the airport are a little more discretionary than the food purchases. Um, food purchases really meet the need for the traveler. They're going to find a place to get their water and a hamburger. Um, often retail is more of a want. I want to pick up that t-shirt. I want to buy that Brighton um, gift. Um, there's a high percentage of the new street side restaurants that fail during the first few years of operation. And there's a number of reasons for that. As I've indicated, it's the competition. It sometimes is the out of control cost, and sometimes it's the overpriced menu items versus the quality of the offerings as well as customer service issues. Passengers are somewhat of a captive audience, as I mentioned, on the airport. No matter how great those concepts are, there still are limited choices at the airport. Competition in the end dictates the winners and losers. It forces the operators to provide the highest level of customer service, not only in the quality of their offerings, but the variety of their offerings, as well as controlling their cost. We do recognize that there are unique factors in the airport environment. The logistics is different. The delivery truck cannot pull up to the back of the door of the restaurant or the store. They have to go through a commissary and pass security. So we recognize that that is a difference. Additionally, the operating hours. The airport is a 24 seven, seven days a week, holidays, weekends, early morning, late nights. So the operation hours do have an impact um, on the operator. There's a hurry factor by our, our customers and our passengers. So speed of service is a must. Our, our customers' primary attention is to make their flight, so it's important that the operators have a focused attention on that speed of service. We also realize that hiring employees is different at the airport. There's security background checks, there's parking that is different, there's security badging requirements. And of course, security is always a layer that can impact the store's operation. And of course, delays. If there's uh, weather in Boston, then there's going to be flight delays, so they may have to keep their hours open later, and that foot traffic comes um, at a later point in time. So we realize that there are different um, factors at the airport environment. So how does Sky Harbor pricing policy compare to the airport industry? One of our industry associations, Airport Council International North America, through its Commercial Management Committee, conducts an annual benchmarking survey. One of the survey questions requests airports to indicate its pricing methodology. This chart reflects 100 airport responses. As you can see, it's almost a 50-50 split among airports, whether they do a street or a street pricing, a street plus percentage. So then we took we have, a look. Ms. Davis, we have a yeah, Mr. There. Chair, thank you. Just a question on, on that one was, and maybe this, maybe this chart is going to address it, but what's the trend right now? Because uh, I think you said 96. Pittsburgh adopted street pricing. So are people going, are the airports going towards more street or more street plus right now? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilman Gates, over that 18 years, um, airports have made some changes. Some may have gone to street. Some have recently in new contracts changed to a street plus percentage. And so when we took a look at our peer airports of the top 20, that's one of the things that we were seeing that it's almost again another 50-50 split. We would like the opportunity to continue to work with our peer airports to understand if they are evaluating any policy changes and what are those factors that they may be making in those changes, or likewise, ones that recently made changes, what drove you to make those changes in your pricing policy? Ms. Favors, uh, Mr. Chair and Ms. Williams, Councilwoman Williams, um, looking at this list and looking at the ACI benchmarking survey, um, as Ms. Favors mentioned earlier, many times airports implement policy change at the time a contract is procured, and that is done so that the operator can effectively uh, create a business pro forma going into it, and, and it's very difficult to do. Um, to implement something that could impact the financial terms of the contract during the course of the contract. And so we really need to spend more time uh, working with these airports to, to get down into the details of, of these ones that are street plus 10%. Are those more recent contracts? And the street pricing are contracts that were procured 10, 
uh, years ago. These contracts only come out um, at an airport because of the capital investment that's required. They're typically bid out every seven to 10 years. Uh, in the case of Terminal 4 Food and Beverage, it had been 20 years uh, before we bid that contract. So some of this information may not reflect the most recent trends of what airports have done in recent procurements. So we, it may be good for us to identify airports in this top 20 list of peer airports that have done recent uh, procurements and, and look at the decisions that they've made uh, for those recent procurements. And that information is not provided here, but we, um, we do need to follow up on that and, and get down into the detail. Another um, aspect of this list of airports is what their, what their business model is for the airport, what kinds of fees are um, incorporated into the contract. For example, LAX, which is a fairly recent um, procurement, they use a developer model and they do street plus, I think, an average of 15 to 18%. And, and that is to cover the costs of, um, among other things, a developer managing the program. So there's a lot of variables. Um, we wanted to provide this information because everyone always asks, what are other airports doing? Um, but we also need to consider all the different variables of each airport and what their business model is. Mm -hmm. I don't need to comment back. Yeah, of course. Tammy, I understand uh, your concern, and I know that you are always very cautious, and you want to make sure that we are comparable to other airports. My fear is we have received so many compliments on the airport mm -hmm. and the, the food that we have, the quality and the service, and now I'm hearing our vendors are going broke. While you study this, we lose business, it doesn't make sense to me. And I'm very, very concerned about this going forward. So I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm thinking in this case, uh, things need to be expedited. Absolutely. Because we have quality, and I want to make sure we keep quality service, quality food, and quality people. Um, that's correct, uh, Mr. Chair, Councilwoman Williams, we do have probably the highest quality food and beverage program uh, in the United States, um, for particularly for large airports. Um, it takes a lot of resources and a lot of capital investment to deliver those brands. As Ms. Favors mentioned, uh, the logistics alone uh, is particularly new. It's one of those variables that needs to be considered. Um, we required a commissary in our new program. We did not have that. Before, we had a, a facility on site. That facility is not um, able to service the program, and we don't have the real estate available to have that luxury going forward in the future. So the food and beverage operators need to provision these um, locations out of a commissary, and that adds uh, logistical complexity and cost to the program. So I, I'm, not, um, I'm not expressing a reluctance um, or concern to look at revisiting the street pricing policy. Um, I'm simply saying we haven't um, had the opportunity to drill down into to answer the question about specifically what the recent trends are. Uh, the concessionaire community tells us the trend is uh, to go to a street plus 10% um, solution, and that is what has been implemented. Um, we have not uh, confirmed that through our research with our industry organizations and through collaboration with other airports. But I was hearing you say you'd have to wait for contract negotiations to return, and, and to me that's very frightening. Oh, no, I apologize, uh, Mr. Chair, Councilwoman Williams. Um, I, I was just referencing that that is typically when um, these changes are made, and so some of the information about other airports and their policies may be old. If their program hasn't been put out to bid recently, um, that, that street pricing policy may have been put in place uh, for contracts that were procured years ago and may not reflect uh, today's trends. Okay. Councilman Gates. Oh, are you? Councilman Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would echo um, <coughs> Councilman Williams' comments. Um, especially, you know, here's the challenge, I think, and, and fortunately you're addressing this in Terminal 3, where you're going to have all the food and beverage after on the other side, whatever you call it, you know, on the other side of security. Okay. But here in Terminal 4, I mean, it's a real obvious concern because if you're going to the airport, especially if you have kids, mm -hmm. like many of us do, you're, you're going to get through that security. You are not going to stop. So 
I don't know what there is that can be done specifically, but I hear concerns about some of those, some of the food and beverage that's out there, you know, on the street side. Um, people are just blowing past that, but there are some great, great restaurants there. So how do we address that too as well? I mean, that's, that's a unique challenge and I don't know how you do it, but I'd love for you to, to look at that as well. And then the other thing, again, I agree. I mean, food and beverage in Terminal 4 is a home run. There's no question. People love it. The one concern that I've heard is, you know, a lack, a perceived at least lack of value, value meals mm -hmm. for people with kids, again, getting back to the issue with kids. And so, you know, if there are things that we can do either to bolster the kids' menus and things like that or, that are available or maybe do a better job of making people aware of those. Because, I mean, people do, um, you know, putting, putting aside the, the first concern, you know, I hear from people with kids, they're like, where, where do we go to get a, a cheap meal? And so, you know, maybe if that's something you can be looking at as well, that would be helpful. Happy to do that. And I know there's some healthy options, although the photo that you showed... <laughs> <laughs> the Chipotle <laughs> was, was not like was not quite bars. fit Phoenix. <laughs> Health food. Uh, so we wanted to provide just a snapshot of the Phoenix uh, food program in particular, in comparison to our peer uh, top 20 airports. And this is for calendar year 2013. And I note that because our food program during 2013, there were significant portions of the program that was closed as they were being reconcepted um, as that contract was awarded, that second contract was awarded. So compared to um, our top 20, the sales per square foot for the average um, top 20 airports is around 1500 $1,540, and their sales per and plane passenger is $6.86. We're just slightly a little below that for Terminal 4 at uh, $13.23 for sales per square foot, with uh, sales per and plane passenger at $6.14. Um, also on news and gifts, we did take a look at the performance of that program, um, realizing that these are contracts that were executed approximately seven years ago, so that is a, a retail concession opportunity that we're working on to be able to issue but it's still holding pretty good to the industry trends. So the top 20 airports on the retail side, at the sales per square foot is 1,363, and we're a little bit below that at 1,316, and our sales are just a few, um, a few um, coins off of the sales per and plane passenger for the industry. And with retail, we realize that there is the influence of the number of connecting passengers that we have in Terminal 4. It's approximately about 40% when we did our last survey in 2013, about 40% of our traffic is connecting out of Terminal 4. So with our most recent procurement with street pricing for food and beverage, we wanted to give like an example of a performa. And um, these are listed are the categories that the operators look at to make up their performa. However, the airport, we do have an influence on those areas, in particular our business terms. We set the product type offering and the location. That definitely influences their cost of goods sold. Um, in particular with food and beverage, we listed that our preference is local, regional, and national brands. We did not wanna have generic or what they consider house brands as part of the program. We also required a commissary, so that also had an influence on their general and administrative expenses. In uh, addition to the product offering, that does influence their salary and benefits. As the concepts are um, provided, some concepts are more labor intensive and the intensity to deliver those services. So we realize that that has an impact on their salary and benefits. We have heard back from our food operators and they do share um, some concerns about the performance of their program. Uh, they anticipated for their net income to range for calendar year um, 14, between 14 and 16%. Our initial review of our calendar year 14 actuals indicate the sales revenue performance is greater than their projections. However, their operators are not achieving this net income that they anticipated. When we looked at industry um, an anal uh, analysis that indicated a reasonable range for these categories, they confirmed that the cost of sales as a percentage of sales um, should range between 28 and 31 percent. I'm sorry, 28 and 38 percent. The labor cost as a percentage of sales should range between 27 and 37 percent. And the sales per square foot should range 
um, between $167 per square foot and $542. We realized that this was a small sample sale from the industry, so we, again, would like to be able to reach out to our peer airports to be able to compare those reasonable ranges. So what we are suggesting that what needs to happen between now and our next subcommittee is we'd like the opportunity to conduct some additional performance analysis. We'd like to continue the conversation with our food operator partners so we can get some additional information on their program specifically. We'd like to be able to determine if the cost factors are associated with the overall program or if it's a particular location or concept that is not successful. And we'd like to see if there are any other operating factors that we can't um, see right now in the initial analysis. So we're recommending a complete evaluation of the, the program at first to be able to understand that. Uh, we want to make sure that we understand those operating factors so as we get ready to issue Terminal 4 retail, we want to see if those same factors will have an impact or does have an impact on the retail operations. For us, while we consider the appropriate street pricing policy for the food program as well as any future RFPs, our goals always remain a win for the customer, a win for the operator, and a win for the airport. Uh, we'd like to return next month with a staff recommendation on the airport street pricing policy. Thank you. Yeah, we do have uh, two cards. First is uh, Stephen Douglas. Speak if necessary. Not necessary. Thank you, Mr. Douglas, for being here. And then next is Pat Murray, SSP America. Speak if necessary. Okay. I have some questions. For Mr. For Mr. Murray. Okay. Mr. Murray, would you mind coming on up? Don't mean to single you out, but you volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> Should have paid attention. <laughs> uh, you operate in other airports, correct? Uh, yeah, SSP operates in 150 airports around the world, 31 here in North America. And do any of your other contracts have, do they have street pricing plus? Yeah, so um, I think that the, the topic is aptly framed up here this morning, and it is something that's changing in our business today. So uh, to, to bluntly answer the question, we only have a couple of airports today that actually are street priced airports, but that topic is changing across the country rapidly for um, a lot of good reasons. I mean, honestly, we're having this conversation because, you know, we have a great program here in Terminal 4 that everybody's proud of. That's a, a trend throughout the country. Others are trying to catch up with the performance of Terminal 4. Um, so major U.S. cities, uh, both, uh, both airports in Houston, um, over the last three months have changed their policy. In the last 12 months, um, both airports in Washington, D.C., Reagan, and Dulles have changed their policy. Los Angeles' uh, staff you know, mentioned also changed their policy. The Bay Area uh, uh, airports also have added pricing to the component. And some of that is, is a reflection of the quality of the programs getting better. Some of it is, as we all uh, recognize, labor and minimum wage is rapidly changing throughout the country. We had 20 uh, of the 50 states take on new minimum wage requirements uh, at the turn of the year. That overflows to the food and beverage part of the business because we manufacture goods in our businesses fairly extremely. And then uh, maybe the other topic that I don't think we addressed, and this is a complicated issue, is Back in 1992, when we were really talking about gouging somebody over a Whopper, those airports were being operated by single operators. So they were being gouged because you really had complete control of it. Today, there are very few North American airports that are operated by a single operator. So the setting is competitive. And when you're talking about the difference of uh, a burger or a sandwich from one person or another, there's choice for people to have, just like there is at Sky Harbor. And those choices are no longer you know, just the, the most basic of things. They're you know, superior offerings. That's true. And, and I know Councilman Gates, if you don't uh, ask the question, because uh, I know he's concerned about children's menus. Uh, do you could take that into consideration? And if so, does that have sure. So I, I was trying to contemplate when uh, the councilman brought up the topic. We have children's menus at all of the 
uh, locations in Sky Harbor. And to be honest with you, um, the Terminal 4 RFP really made our company think a lot more about that because this is becoming a bigger issue. As we serve some more sophisticated foods, you know, we also have to realize that doesn't work for everybody, right? So while we have them, I don't know that we do the best job in advertising those for children. So we, we perhaps need to uh, think about how we market those things a little bit better. And, and I don't mean to just pick on you. It's just that you volunteer. Um, <laughs> but I, I have concerns. Do you have concerns about your operation? Um, well, I, at first, I would say we're blessed by having a great opportunity to work in a great city with a lot of great uh, partners. Does the business model have challenges? I would say, you know, the hardest part is having to speak in public and say, we have a couple thousand people that are working at the airport. You know, we have to take care of their employees of our company. It's important to us. A at the same time, how do you make decisions about what are the macroeconomic influences in our country, which is real. When you're changing minimum wage by 50 percent and we're adding fringe costs to labor, which are all real things, you know, every good company wants to take care of its employees, right? Well, those things dramatically change the business model that we operate in. And it do, it's, it's not just in Sky Harbor. Obviously, this is everywhere in the country. This is affecting us. So I, I hope that answers your question. It does. I, I just know that my groceries at home have gone way up. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to deal with labor costs. Uh, but I worry because I want to make sure that that quality continues. That's what we're known for. And, and not only the service, but the food. And I just think it's very important that we take good care because I want the employees treated well as as well, and I, I'm just hearing some concerns. And I appreciate you coming up and, and speaking today. I uh, didn't mean to put you on the spot. Well, yes, I did, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, thank you. For thank you, Councilman. Us. Thank I, you, Mr. I Chairman. You work closely with staff because I think this is very important. I don't want us to take our time doing this and lose some opportunities for these retailers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You can douglas this with the host if you want to. Oh, you wanna, well, can I put host on the him. spot? <laughs> Absolutely. Basically, the what, same what question. I had to, I had to. Oh, yeah, so, um, th I think there was a lot of questions there. It, it, the, it was, basically. The, the, uh, I would say in, in, in the airports that we operate in, um, approximately 70% are street plus priced um, and the trend has been moving towards street plus pricing um, a few recent examples are Cincinnati um, Indianapolis um, and just this week uh, Montreal um, have changed their policies from street to street plus because I, I want house to be successful and I'm I'm just concerned because I know that uh, as a council uh, we wanted the quality we uh, encouraged uh, better employee benefits, et cetera, and that's a cost to you. And I... Yeah, yeah matter of fact, we're very, pr we're, one, thank you for the opportunity because we're very proud of our program here. Um, it's a special place in our heart. Uh, from the time we started the program um, until today, we've actually increased our average wage by about 18%. Um, and some of that was driven by our, our collective bargaining agreement, but more of it was driven by changing from the old type concepts that were here to much more culinary um, friendly uh, uh, concepts. So we were changing from someone who might be in a Cinnabon to some, a chef, you know, running a very complicated brand. Um, so, and our benefit costs have risen approximately 40%, um, and our FTEs have increased over 100. So over 125. So we've been, we're very proud of the program. We're very proud of the customer um, feedback that we get. And we're also proud of the fact that we've been able to take care of the employees um, through the process and provide better jobs at higher wages. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll, since you're up there, I'll ask you the same issue too, is uh, with respect to these concerns that I'm hearing about, you know, lower value or lower price or, you know, kids, Menus, can you talk about what you guys do um, in that in that space and, and to make people aware that they're even available? Yeah, we, we also have kids menus um, and thinking through this, we need to do a better job with our marketing teams to promote those um, as well as in, in other markets where there are street plus um, uh, pricing policies. We 
offer a discount to all airport employees, whether you work for the airline, uh, another retailer, another food operator, um, a discount to get you back to street. So um, the you know the the hardworking people who are in the airport every day um, will have the opportunity to, to get that discount. Um, but we do need to do a little better job of marketing the kids programs that we have. Thank you. I appreciate you pointing that out. I think that's incredibly important. Uh, you know, depending on how we move forward, we, we should consider the hardworking people that, uh, you know, that are there doing the job and take them into consideration. Thank now, you. Thank, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, I do. So I, you know, obviously there's something else coming up here very soon, the, the T4 retail, uh, which is coming up. Obviously, I'm, I'm assuming this has to be worked out prior to prior to the retail RFP, or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Mr. Chair and subcommittee members, this is absolutely the right time to make decisions about our street pricing policies so that we can uh, put those business terms in place before we uh, compete for another major concession. Um, we achieved tremendous results with our food and beverage program. We have the highest quality program we could ask for. We have more jobs at the airport, higher wages and benefits for the employees involved in that program. Um, but if costs are out of line from what was anticipated at the time of that contract, then now is the right time for us to make that correction uh, and change to our policy. But I would uh, strongly recommend that um, if, if we are to consider a change um, and uh, if the council uh, is ready to adopt a street plus a percentage pricing policy for Sky Harbor, doing that in advance of uh, the retail procurement would be the right thing to do. I, I think that is the right thing to do, you know, as opposed to, I mean, it would just, I think it'd be a, a mess if, if it's done any other way. That said, I agree with my colleagues. I think this is something that really does have to be expedited. We have to figure out if that's the direction we want to go. <laughs> Because the T4 retail uh, has been has been continued for quite some time, and I think for good reason. You want to be sure that it's all done correctly. There's no doubt in my mind that that is, you know, that it, it, the right thing has been done by by continuing this item. Mm -hmm. uh, but if if this is the holdup, we really need to tackle this uh, to get on with it, so that we can actually get to this T4 retail. Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, what I've asked the airport to try and pursue and uh, is so is to work as expeditiously as they can to be before you in the next meeting with a recommendation about um, street pricing as it relates to Terminal 4 food and beverage and uh, how street pricing may influence T4 uh, retail uh, to try and get your concurrence. The retail, um, I, I this person would very strongly like to get us going on both of those on the next agenda, but they're, uh, as Tammy and her team are working through providing you the fact-based evidence of the number that we're going to provide, we, we just want to make sure, I want you to know, we're pursuing as hard as we can, recognizing uh, we will solve for T4 food and beverage next time. Uh, I hope T4 retail, if, if it slips a month, it's because we have invested lots of energy to try and get T4 food and beverage accomplished. That's all. Uh, having said that, can you, if you focus first on the food and beverage and you could bring that, I mean, I'm that's our hopefully, focus, mm -hmm. but I don't want to hold that up. We, we you could delay the RFP for a little bit to make sure you had the right policy because by the time it comes through subcommittee, I'm sure it's going to have to go uh, beyond for some approvals. I, I don't want to wait until you have all of it prepared. I think it's important we move forward. Councilman Valenzuela, Councilman Williams, that's exactly uh, our intention is to solve the food and beverage. I would like to keep T4 retail moving apace, but if it cannot, we will solve for T4 food and beverage nonetheless. Right. Thank you. So it's food and beverage. It's also retail, obviously. They're not Tammy, I'm far enough from Tammy sell. that she can't right. kick me. Um, she's looking like she's I know, she, she is, but it's okay. I'm not making eye contact with her I don't right know now. how well her aim is, but she may throw something. It's okay. I, I have a hard head. Okay. Great. I noticed. Sounds good. No further questions, comments from my colleagues. Thank you so much for, uh, for working on this. Okay. We will go to item six, International Economic Development and Export Readiness Initiative.
updates. Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, economic development staff is here to tell you why uh, Phoenix is hot, and but we do not want to yeah, deal with you. the uh, no. officiating which council district <laughs> is hotter. We, we do we know that? which one is the coolest, though. We I'm know. having no. Oh yeah. man! Right. Um, I know who's still number one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> None of us are going to argue with that. So, like I part. said, we will not officiate uh, as to which uh, we think our community is hot uh, all the way around, and is in. And I would actually tell you, great things are happening uh, because of the leadership of the mayor and. City Council. Um, we're here today to talk about um, the ac actions and activity that you have been directing us uh, and giving us um, counsel and advice on and staff's execution of that work in the international arena. We come by quarterly to see you and this is one of those updates uh, and timely that it is now because uh, as you can see in your report there are many things that are going on. So with that I'll turn it over to Ms. Mackey. Good morning, Chairman and Council Members. Thanks for having us here today. We are here to provide you an update on the exciting activities going on, not only in our international arena, but also in our export readiness and, and export front. Um, following your direction, you'll remember a month or two ago, you did authorize some additional funds to come into community and economic development to drive our export program. So we're here today to talk you through exactly how we're using those funds and how we're moving forward. With that, I'll turn it over to Hank Marshall. Good morning, Chairman Valenzuela and council members. It's uh, terrific to be here again. Um, I was going to say all of you are hot, but in absence of saying that, you're all cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're delighted to be able to bring you up on our activities on as they relate to international, as well as the very exciting news that we've got to share with you as they relate to exports. I point this out because it is very evident to me and our staff as we are out meeting companies and we're in the community, it's evident that Phoenix really has its eye on the world. The, the dialogue about international being important, that it matters, and many of that, a lot of that is being driven by all of you, making it a priority, creating the awareness. I can be in an elevator and someone will hit me up and say, hey, did you see the, the latest you did, the United States Department of Commerce export numbers? I'll go back five years ago and people wouldn't even know what they were. So people are looking. I get a comment last week when the British company bought the University of Phoenix buildings here in town and someone said, that was really cool. So the idea that people are paying attention is a significant thing for us. It makes it very evident that a lot of the work that we're doing is being seen. In the spirit of keeping this kind of cool and hip and <laughs> interesting, uh, you should have seen the original slide. It had to be tamed down. So this, this is uh, a tamed down version. The idea is first, just to give you an idea of some firsts. The first office in Mexico City was opened in October. Uh, the first dedicated trade representative for Mexico was also a first. Right now we're at about 40 supply chain leads with that office and going higher. We have our first dedicated export program called Export Tech, which I will tell you about a little bit later. The city of Phoenix was an integral part in velocity the first component of Velocity to go live will be the Metro Export Plan that the City of Phoenix chaired, co-chaired on that committee. It will also be the first launching of the Metro Phoenix Export Alliance, a group formed to take the export plan live. I'd also like to say that we are working with ASU to entertain the first new sister city in the City of Phoenix in 10 years compiling a list of compatible cities that we ought to be looking at and making that a priority. Number two, we've had two bilateral trips with Mexico that have been completed. We have two significant upcoming international events between now and June. We've had two recent events, Verde Exchange and Phoenix Startup Week, both of which have had international participation and engagement that is significantly better than it has been in years past again because of the interest that we're able to, uh, to attract. In addition, we have two Promozec economic MOUs with two cities in Mexico, again to advance the opportunity with them further. Four, I bring this one up is because it's important. Both us, GPAC, and ACA are finally in agreement and in alignment that there are four international markets that ought to be on everybody's radar. Up till now, they've been disconnected. We've all been chasing different things. It's important that we be uh, focusing on the same things. 
And they are, as you can imagine, Mexico, Canada, Europe, and Asia. Go back again a year ago, and they were not consistent. It makes it so that we're not tripping all over each other, we're not duplicating efforts, and we're focusing on what matters. Five, we have five upcoming international trips between now and the end of June. We have two going to Mexico, one going to, to Canada, one going to Germany, and one going to China. And we have five export plans that we have crafted, first of a kind, available nowhere else, and I'll be telling you about those in a minute. Eleven, we've had our 11th foreign visitor, dignitary, or trade since the beginning of the year. We are tracking at a pace never seen here before. We have had five visitors in the past three weeks, Finland, Belgium, Angola, and Spain. In the next two weeks, we will have officials and companies from Japan and the UK here. Again, unrivaled. And all of it's about economic opportunity. How do we mutually pursue that? 16. 16 percent, just to tell you where we are on exports, the final quarter of 2014, Phoenix Metro exports were up 16 percent, tracking three times faster than what they were projected to. 50. Those are the plan BREs that we have in place right now to meet with existing foreign companies or ones that are exporting, doing a better job of getting at that community and making we sure we understand what they're doing. Now, the other side of the equation is, it's all right if we're looking at the world, is the world looking at us? And are we relevant and are we mattering? And we believe that this is one area that we, we needed to improve on and we indicated in our plan we were gonna come up with some marketing concepts to make this a reality. What we've done is we've created an identity that Phoenix connects to the Americas. And to give you an idea of how relevant that is, in the foreign direct investment market right now, it used to be that people wanted a location in the U.S. where their business could thrive, a single point. Right now, those foreign direct investment locates are looking at a place where it can be a substantive, substantive base. But that location has to offer connectivity, both immediate and extended, to multiply their market access. Wherever these companies are going, that location has to provide that. Phoenix is doing that now. And I'd like to give you a couple examples. Rainers is a Belgian company that opened in Phoenix on the 19th of February. Matilda Rainers and Graham Walsh, the two senior people at Rainers, indicated that Graham had studied the U.S. market for a year, from Washington to Texas. They concluded, without any reservation, Phoenix was the place to put their U.S. headquarters and base of operations because it would allow them to connect to other parts of the Americas. Authentication Industries is a French company. It'll be here Thursday and Friday of this week. Business France is a division of the French government that aids French companies go abroad. Authentication Industries approached Business France and said, identify five locations in the United States where our business authentication industries would thrive. Business France came back with three, New York City, Phoenix, and San Francisco. The company was in New York the early part of this week. The team in New York only managed to get that company three meetings. Authentication Industries will be in San Francisco next week where they have five meetings teed up. I'm proud to tell you that Authentication Industries will be here Thursday and Friday, and we got them 10. So again, the level of community support and interest surpasses any other market that these companies are looking at. A company that I believe Councilman Valenzuela and, uh, and Chairman Valenzuela is familiar with, The Refinery, is a Montreal-based company. They had been looking at 10 markets in the United States, and Phoenix wasn't one of them. With the assistance of Councilman Valenzuela, we asked them to come out here and take a look. Not only did we change their mind, but October 1st, they're moving their entire operation from Montreal to Phoenix to get at the broader opportunity here. The final example I'd like to give you is a small Mexican consulting firm by the name of CBA 21 that is currently locating in Phoenix. Their operations and headquarters are in Mexico City. They're opening up their office in Phoenix 
because according to the owners, it is the best place to get an opportunity in the US and Canada. So it reinforces that message that Phoenix connects the Americas. We will be doing our part to make that part of our broader marketing plan and include that in Phoenix is hot. Exports. Exports, we've been preaching that these matter and they're important and they are. Every billion dollars of exports creates 5,600 jobs. We've indicated we're gonna double exports to Mexico by 2020, double exports globally by 2025. The implications of that are 35,000 jobs related to the Mexico increase and a total of 89,000 jobs attributed to the global increase. It matters, that's why we're spending the time on this. Real quick, one day, Secretary, Assistant Secretary Bruce Adams, I'll come out to one place in the US for one day, asked his staff in Washington, where should I go? They told him Phoenix. They told him Phoenix. And he came out and visited APS Bio. Any of you heard of APS Bio? Well, now you do. Company on South Central employs 200 people. It exports its product to 57 different countries around the world. 60% of its business is from exports and growing. It was a fabulous visit, and we're likely to get Mr. Andrews back. Export readiness we talked about. Exports have been happening for a long time in a very fractured, dysfunctional way. As a company, as the mayor likes to indicate, goes from export curious to export serious, they first become informed. Can I do it? Is it for me? What is it all about? Educating. Can I do it? What's relevant for me? Finally, can somebody help me? We've succeeded in aggregating a lot of that by working with the Global Chamber, by working with ASBA, by working with a lot of people to start taking ownership of that and putting it all in one place. And I'd like to focus on what we're doing at the assistance side to make this all work. February 27th, we started our first export tech program. Doug Devereaux, who runs that program out of Virginia, for the first time in three years, flew out to a market to be present for the first day of the session because we were the first cohort in two years to have a full cohort of eight companies. Not only that, he was impressed with the caliber of people that we seated there, how good they were. That program runs to the beginning of May. These companies will graduate with a business export plan on May 1st. The four other programs that you see up there right now were created by the CED team for the city of Phoenix. They don't exist anywhere else. Global Target will be a program that will invite and bring in companies new to exports, educate them and assist them on the process of creating a plan to move forward. Global Reach will be a program launched specifically to companies that are already exporting. How do you find new markets and get at them? Export Connector is a program that will integrate exporters and export service providers. How do you people more closely link to become more familiar and be collaborative. CEO Export Circles is a program that will take CEOs of existing exporting companies, make sure that they're working together, sharing best practice, and most importantly, these CEOs will be deployed to mentor other Phoenix companies on how to begin exporting. Quickly to summarize it in a nutshell, the numbers on the bottom are 2013 numbers, 7 billion and 19 billion. The numbers on the top are 21 and nine. The far right is Arizona. You can see Arizona's numbers have gone up. More importantly, you can see the numbers on the left as they relate to Mexico. Please keep in mind, 79% of those numbers are attributed to Metro Phoenix. So those increases of 22% and 68% are due to Phoenix. In the center of the chart, Take a look at where exports were nationally in 2010, 1.3 trillion. Last year, they were 2.35. 305,000 companies around the country are involved in it, 6,000 in our city, and they're growing. Let me just ask a question about that slide. That's a huge jump in the U.S. exports from 2010 to 2011. Um, 800 million. What, what, what was going on there? Because clearly since 2011, it, it's continued to go up, but not at that large. That, that's a very good question. That happened to coincide when Penny, Penny Pritzker was appointed as the Commerce Chairman and the Obama administration launched the National Export Initiative. So there were a couple things that, that converged to make that a priority. The goal at the time was to take that number 1.3 and make it 3.1. 
by 2014. That hasn't happened, but it is certainly tracking in the right direction and gaining momentum. How do you plan to advertise this and put the word out and get more of our community businesses involved? Very good question. Um, both through our website, which is being currently redone, through our outreach efforts, and uh, we've, we are getting an article a week in the Phoenix Business Journal after having talked to both the publisher, Ray Shea, and the reporter, Eric Toll. We are feeding them stories every week on successes of companies, events that we're holding, programs that we're launching to specifically make sure that people know where they, what things are going on. Do the do, do, pardon me. Did, do you work with the chambers and, and other business organizations? Through the Chair Councilman Williams, we do. We work very closely with the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, with the, uh, the Black Chamber of Commerce, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, to make sure that they're all engaged so their constituents know about these programs as well, providing them that information. We're also going out and one-on-one -on -one meeting with our companies. Um, Hank and his team are meeting with 50 companies to let them know exactly what we're doing and how we can help. That's our goal on a short term is to meet with 50 and we'll add more and more. Not only that, but when our business retention expansion team goes out and meets with the 500 companies they're meeting with, they do share that information and ask if they're interested in learning about exporting. Do you have information that you could feed the council members that we could put out in our news? Absolutely. We'd be yes. happy, to, be do happy to do that. I, I think it's an, you know, it's, it's a little different level, but sh we at the neighborhoods, which are a lot of local business people, and, and I just think it's important to, to get the people behind you, uh, to recognize the value and know what you're doing. Well, those are jobs, too. That's, yeah. that's who's going to be working yeah. at yeah. these companies, the people in our neighborhoods, respectively, all of us. It's a great idea. We'll get that right to you. Okay. We can do it weekly. We will. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilwoman, yeah. do you have something? Yes, I guess keying off what Councilwoman Williams' question, we have the Phoenix Chamber is doing some business retention business <coughs> visits in partnership. Um, the council members are doing business retention visits. The Commerce Authority is doing business retention visits. The Global Initiative is doing business retention visits. Many of us only find out about these after they occur, and, and speaking with some of those other parties, they don't always know what's going on. And so I do think there is some opportunities to do better coordination, because that could be a lot of business retention visits if we, if we don't work together. And many times when we go, some of the things the businesses will bring up are things that all of those different parties can address. And maybe if we can do it more efficiently, that would. Through the Chair, Councilwoman Gallego, what we're working on right now is a, kind of a one-stop posting where we can, all of those organizations can log on, see the companies we've met with, talk about the new programs, and we'll do a better job at getting that information out to those organizations in advance, making sure we do stay on the same page. I agree with you, we can do a much better job at that, and we'll do that. Questions? Okay. I'll be quiet. <laughs> is it, is that, uh... That's it, yes. And I think what you'll see from us is this is as get council's direction and you've been working with us on putting our action plan together and driving our initiatives. So this is a key component of our long-term <laughs> growth strategy for Phoenix, really to grow Phoenix um, and in that international and global industries. Good. Any other questions or comments? Councilman? I just want to say having worked for our uh, Arizona manufacturer for the past 14 years that's exported billions of dollars of goods. Uh, I'm thrilled to see this emphasis because it, we we really have, you know, for for Ping, they had to kind of figure this out on their own. I mean, literally, it's sort mm -hmm. of a, you know, legendary story out there. But for the companies that are coming up now, what you're doing for them is going to be of such great benefit to them and a benefit of those people who are going to go to work for those companies um, that maybe aren't, you know, are either unemployed now or underemployed. So thank you for what you're doing. This is a fantastic project, and I'm thrilled by uh, what you presented today. Okay, I'll just say uh, I, I also want to thank, I agree, Paul Blue. Uh, you, have, you have such an amazing team, you know, with Paul Blue and Chris Mackey and, of course, Hank Marshall. Uh, and and several others that are part of the team that are thinking about these things every day that are being 
incredibly bold and uh, and and you know these decisions are are calculated which is important for everyone to understand this is not just let's just throw some things you know against the wall and and see what sticks kind of thing this is incredibly uh, knowledgeable very calculated already producing results and this is a, a big deal uh, so so uh, you know I also want to thank you uh, there are a lot, lots of other stories like the refinery coming the refinery is a big deal we were not even on the map and they stopped into Phoenix and it's a matter of meeting with them every time they come in and they are impressed and they're they're helping to tell the Phoenix story as they come in and uh, and there are more stories like that on the way so very exciting and thank you so much for your commitment okay so we will go next to the uh, Item seven, finally, the Super Bowl 49 results. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, staff's here today uh, to talk with, uh, through with you um, uh, what happened during Super Bowl. And I don't think we have a particularly um, unique back of the scenes insight, although we do have data that is uh, new and we want to present to you. Um, and we're, we're providing a little, and I, I think, uh, uh, Tammy Vo for bringing an object lesson on our, uh, which we'll get to in a second, uh, of a little bit of evidence. But um, by all lights, uh, w great outcomes for um, for the Super Bowl 49 in the for the state in the Valley and for Phoenix specifically. Um, but truly, it starts with the City Council's commitment uh, in 2010 to staff to pursue trying to be a part of the team securing uh, the Super Bowl's uh, location here. Uh, just uh, last month, uh, and your continued support as we went through the better part of two years of planning and, in some cases, inconvenience for folks who work uh, here and live here. Uh, and I think, uh, but in working together, we were able to have a good, uh, good set of outcomes. And we're here today to talk to you about uh, what's happened uh, and uh, get your feedback on uh, ways we can do things better because. Uh, literally, the planning actually already started a couple weeks ago, thinking about the National Football uh, Collegiate Football Championship game, which is actually uh, less than a year away now in January of next year. And then in two years, uh, the Final Four will be here. And so uh, we continue to have both recognize we had good success, but we're a work in progress, and we can continue, continue to do better uh, and improve our game. And we're here to tell you our story. So I'll turn it over to John Chan. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the sub subcommittee, uh, yes, Paul's right. By by all accounts, Super Bowl 49 was an overwhelming success, not only for the city, but the entire region and the state. Uh, the actual game, more than 114 million viewers tuned in to watch Super Bowl 49, making it the most watched television show in history. And meanwhile, the city of Phoenix was busy setting some uh, Super Bowl records of our own. Uh, Super Bowl Central, which you, you see the image of uh, the uh, uh, Block 23 uh, uh, was um, held, hosted more than 1 million attendees uh, over a period of five days, making it the largest event ever held in downtown Phoenix. Uh, in addition, the Phoenix Convention Center, Valley Metro, Phoenix Sky Harbor, all saw record numbers of event attendees and passengers alike. So in, in terms of planning for the success of Super Bowl, more than 20 uh, or approximately 20 city departments were involved working collaboratively with our partners at the Arizona Super Bowl Host Committee, Visit Phoenix, uh, Downtown Phoenix Inc., all working collaboratively to make uh, Downtown Phoenix the epicenter of all things Super Bowl. Uh, so throughout the, the um, talking about the success of Super Bowl, there are three uh, key lessons learned, if you will, uh, to our, our success. The first one was sound planning and uh, execution. So our city staff departments are well versed in, in developing operational plans, and it was a matter of, of scaling uh, those plans to expect record crowds in the, in the downtown Phoenix. Um, the, the, that planning process was uh, two years in the making. The second key to our success uh, was a contingency planning, and led by uh, our public safety uh, staff, uh, Office of Emergency Management, police and fire, working with their counterparts at the federal, state, and local levels. Uh, there were a number of 
uh, tabletop exercises, which resulted in uh, a significant amount of emergency preparedness, which, um, you know, at the end of the day, there were no significant issues uh, related to uh, public safety as a result of that uh, preparedness. And then the third key to, to our success, I would say, is the communication piece. There was a lot of communication going on uh, internally within uh, the organization with our partners. Um, more than 125 uh, public uh, individual and group stakeholder meetings were held with uh, downtown business and property owners, um, employers in, in the downtown and neighborhood uh, groups and associations. Uh, we were very active in social media side uh, as part of uh, the planning effort. Uh, the host committee uh, put together with the input from a lot of uh, city input a uh, Know Before You Go website. And this was a website dedicated to uh, where people could find information on parking, um, transit, um, uh, road closures, uh, airport information. So uh, as a result of that, putting together that website, Know Before You Go had more than 111 individual uh, page views uh, on that website, which really helped to communicate uh, to the uh, community about information about uh, the Super Bowl. And then lastly, uh, on uh, there was a lot of outreach to the local and national media, which resulted in a lot of positive media impressions about Phoenix, not only as a host city, but as a community and as a place to do business. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tammy to talk a little bit more detail about some of the results in the media uh, outreach. Thanks, John. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members. Um, really, I'm excited to tell you about uh, what's taken place here in our public information office and the instrumental role that um, our staff played in the Super Bowl events. We really um, looked at this as our opportunity to showcase how awesome Phoenix is to the rest of the world. And I wanted to give you a look at our efforts uh, by the numbers. 24-7 um, is what our staff worked um, each day to quickly and efficiently get out the emergency communications and the know before you go <laughs> information and to target media from around the world really one-on-one -on -one while they were here. Uh, more than 5,000 uh, journalists traveled to Phoenix from across the world to cover this event, and 800 stands for the number of uh, articles that were produced worldwide on the city of Phoenix and the Super Bowl, and that's what all these big binders amount to, stories about the city of Phoenix, and many of them very positive, and showcase what Phoenix is all about. Our pitching strategy was really a, a three-phase approach, our pitching strategy to the media. Um, we worked with our external partners, including Visit Phoenix, Downtown Phoenix, Inc., and the host committee um, in three phases to target all of the key media audiences around the country. We started with the eight, uh, when it was down to the eight final teams going to the Super Bowl. Um, then in our second phase, we narrow that down to four. And then finally, um, our final two teams that headed to the Super Bowl. And by that point, we had really established a lot of key relationships with the media entities in those cities. So at that point, we built off that relationship and were able to accomplish um, and get out some really positive stories about the city of Phoenix. I wanna share with you some notable media coverage that we received during this time period. Um, the Today Show was here, as you probably know. Uh, we got Al Roker out for a night on the town in the city of Phoenix, and he headed to the Barrio Cafe to get a sample of some local dishes. Um, he met with artist Angel Diaz to paint a mural, and then he bumped into Mayor Stanton at the airport. Um, the mayor was so kind to offer him um, what we consider to be our key to the city for this event, which was a sun catcher promising Al and the rest of his team from Chile, New York City, um, a lifetime of sunshine. So I'm sure they're uh, hoping for that. That's so well. Yeah, the rest, um, this also is a, a slice of some of the other national media that we um, got during this time period. The Now is a uh, show that is um, sh uh, aired in eight major markets across uh, the country. We invited one of their reporters to um, cover the Kick the Waste initiative, and she even went down to the 27th Avenue transfer station to stand in front of a, a pile of steaming compost um, to showcase the uh, city of Phoenix efforts. And another national media entity um, in their article said, thank you, Phoenix, for um, sending a lot of the waste uh, to other areas other than our landfills. 
And we know that we have a great pizza story to tell. Uh, we had a reporter out here from Boston, and they've got great pizza out there, but they did say, quote, some of the, this is some of the best pizza in the country. So that was um, exciting to see. Also, Morning Joe was here reporting live from downtown Phoenix in the Super Bowl Central Activities. Um, one of our, I really enjoyed this story on the bottom right. You'll see this reporter trekking up Camelback Mountain, and we sent him up there along with several other uh, reporters to get an idea of the great hiking that we have in our city that probably the rest of the world may not know about unless they've been here before. So um, he hiked up Camelback and told his viewers back in the Northwest that Phoenix was really beautiful and that the pictures don't do it justice. These are some of my favorite quotes that were run in national media um, across the country. Phoenix no longer a bench warmer when it comes to big events like this, that the event was a big success, talking about our public transportation, that we're a very vibrant and progressive community, and really speculating about when the next Super Bowl is going to come to Arizona. Excited about that, and that was really um, exciting to see. Uh, we talked a little bit about social media and how that was such a um, really big deal and how we communicated messages to the media and the public during this event. Um, you might recognize some of these uh, screenshots here. Um, of course, our mayor and council, as well as our city manager, um, nice. getting yeah. out and about in Super Bowl <laughs> Central. Um, some of our strategy included <laughs> recording short snippets of videos that we were able to quickly post on social media of challenges, climbing the Grand Canyon experience. Miss Vo, we have one. Well, I'm afraid, very, to, very I'm afraid to no, no, hand no. it over. No, 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 no. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, thank you, Tammy, for not putting the picture of me going up uh, <laughs> the rock wall. Uh, thank you for that. Councilman Gates, are you sure that's not next in my slide? <laughs> the, 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 fo oh, the photo there, <laughs> the photo there, you'll notice Zerker our city manager, Ed Zerker, uh, this is called brain ball. You don't want to challenge Ed and yeah. something with brain in it. He, Although you look ahead right there. I was ahead. <laughs> the field goal was wide left. That's how it goes. It was a lot of fun. Well, we were really excited to capture that. And uh, these uh, posts really did get a lot of hits on social media. So it spoke to the strategy of really capturing things quickly and, and getting them up on social media. These are two of my favorite um, posts on social media, the Seahawks thanking the city of Phoenix Great. and Lenny Kravitz in the back of a uh, police unit being taken to one of his performances, thanking the fine uh, men and women of the Phoenix Police Department. So that was really exciting to see. Um, Really, you know, the best message of all, we've talked a lot about messaging and, and our efforts, but I thought the best message of all really comes from the people who came to our city to and the people who live here to experience what we um, had to offer during the Super Bowl Central time period. And I really enjoyed a, an email that I got from a couple who came here from Kentucky um, telling us that the city was clean, the people were very nice, and they have plans to visit Phoenix again. And I think this is really um, what our efforts were all about. So with that, I'll turn it back over to John Chan. So we'd like to wrap this up with a video that we produced uh, along with Phoenix 11. And, and so this is a recap video. And this, we'll, we'll be using this video as a sales piece for uh, future business. Uh, we'll be using it with meeting planners and uh, event organizers. So with that, let's go ahead and watch the video. This is what we call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we may. Uh, are we going to give this one more uh, try? Yeah, it was working. Um, 
while we're while we're working on that, um, there is one more piece of the puzzle that is uh, uh, my uh, part of the presentation, and that is a discussion of costs. And so, um, as you can imagine, uh, delivering uh, public services across uh, actually well more than just uh, downtown Phoenix, but actually across the city and participating with uh, partners across the region. Uh, I'll say something in about uh, five minutes. <laughs> I want to stop. So just, I, I just have to share, uh, thank you, I just have to share one uh, uh, Super Bowl story. Uh, so at the convention center, we hosted the media center, about 6,000 uh, international and national media people. And usually on the Saturday before Super Bowl, the, the media center clears out and everybody heads out to the, to the uh, stadium. So on Super, Bowl send, send, on Super Bowl Sunday, I'm walking through the media station. There's one radio station still broadcasting. And one of the people from the radio station come up to me and they go, how long can we keep broadcasting? And I said, you could probably broadcast until Monday after the commissioner's press conference. And he said, great, because we're from Boston, our flights are canceled, and we don't know when we're getting home. <laughs> uh, so Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, um, I, before I jump into the numbers, I do wanna say one thing, and that is um, the staff of the city of Phoenix 
uh, and the community members that comprise the Super Bowl host committee are who made this thing be successful. And it was, I can tell you without a doubt, uh, the leadership of uh, John and his team uh, and, mem and leaders from every department like Tammy who just simply rolled up their sleeves, just went and did the work. They had, and for most of these folks, they're professional staff, and so they had a day job that their day job just kept going, and they did this job too. And so I'm very, very grateful for their work, their commitment, their drive. Without their commitment and the commitment of the host committee and the community sponsors who really got involved in this, uh, we wouldn't have seen the success that Phoenix enjoyed as a part of the overall community. And so I just really want to commend uh, John and the full city team for all that they did. Uh, I'm just mostly the talking head. They did all the hard work and I'm very appreciative of their work and again of the support of the mayor and city council for helping us um, uh, push through this event. So on costs, um, we, we divide costs, I would say, into four different ways. Uh, the first is uh, for departments who are directly involved in the operational aspects of service delivery in the community, not including the convention center and the airport. And so we divide costs for those groups into two ways. One is hard costs. Those are direct out the door dollars that we spend uh, on overtime, commodity or services like um, barricading expenses. Or you saw the Public Works Department had all of those nice uh, trash receptacles and recycling uh, bins that were out. Uh, and all out, and th so that was a vendor who delivered um, that work. So all of those hard costs is a number we've been able to define pretty well, but we're still working to accumulate in, the so in what we would call soft costs, uh, which is those costs where, as I said, you have a staff member who worked on their shift uh, and conducted their normal work, didn't do overtime. They happened to do work either associated with Super Bowl Central or somewhere in the city delivering service and their work duties involved in some way, uh, like police officers uh, providing service in the Camelback area uh, near one of the team hotels. Um, we're still working to try and perfect who all worked where and when on their shift so we can capture that. But in terms of overtime and uh, commodity costs, it's just under $2 million will be our expenditure uh, in those departments. 1.97 is the number we've accumulated at this point. Uh, so at the Phoenix Convention Center, uh, they conduct business all the time. Uh, the Super Bowl is the biggest thing they've ever done, but actually, and we, sh we will come back to this subcommittee in a meeting or two, and John will tell you that 2015 uh, is probably going to be the busiest year the Phoenix Convention Center has ever had. A uh, little bit of a softness in September and December, otherwise we're full up. And so as a natural order of business, the Convention Center conducts business with conventions. Some costs are paid by the um, producers of that convention, and they, we charge back time to them. Uh, we have varying degrees of rent that are charged and varying degrees of income uh, that are collected. And what John's mission from the manager and from the mayor and council is, we need to have a net positive economic output when we're done. And I will tell you that was a very strong charge to John uh, this time because the last time uh, the convention center did not have that outcome um, and it was the costs uh, exceeded um, the revenues that we believe we produce. I can tell you with, um, uh, with uh, I'm very happy to report the convention center had about $720,000 of expenses. Um, the convention center currently based on just our preliminary uh, review and we don't have all the revenue numbers in uh, has about a $1.2 million revenue capture during that time frame. So not only do we cover our costs, but the, but the convention center fund balance is today just purely on event revenues, about a half a million dollars to the good. Um, and so I, I want to publicly acknowledge John's efforts because that was not easy. There were many people who wanted him to do many things uh, for them and he was able in spite of an environment where we're in the business of yes at the convention center how do we help our business partners deliver their event we did it in an environment that uh, provided net revenue um, the airport 
is a little bit more complicated. The, no, the number I have is between two, is between two hundred and fifty and three hundred and sixty thousand dollars was their expenditures and hard costs. Uh, but I will tell you, the airport expends that on uh, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, on NASCAR weekends. Every year, the Phoenix Open is here, uh, Memorial Day, and so. I, I thought it was fair because I told you I would do this to explain the numbers they accumulated based to their work effort that was unique and different around this event. But this is, um, and, and I don't have an estimation for you on revenues that are produced, um, but I am confident with outsized passenger activity that there will be net positive revenues for the airport um, as a result uh, that, will, that will exceed the expenditure they've had. Um, and so. Those are, uh, so in three of the areas, I have some facts for you uh, today. We're still working on those soft costs where, uh, which would include me and, and John and Tammy who are, who, um, uh, and, and hourly workers throughout the organization who did street sweeping and they happened to do street sweeping through Super Bowl Central. Uh, they were police officers on duty and some of their duty happened to be related to the Super Bowl. Uh, but we, uh, we did not incur additional new or unique expenses associated with them. They were working somewhere that day. It happened to be that their work was associated uh, in some way or fashion during their work shift uh, with uh, Super Bowl related activities, whether in downtown, activities in Glendale, or locations um, citywide. We hope to have the more accumulated information for you um, by your meeting next time so that we can have that a as we promised um, we would do for you. And so, uh, uh, and, and finally, I, to that front, I would tell you um, we are staying within the authorized and approved budget of the Phoenix City Council last year. And so nobody is spending more than they already had authorized in their budget. We're, we're living inside of, um, and so if folks had spending that um, for whatever reason uh, exceeded what they planned. They're making the adjustments necessary to accommodate the activity with inside of the budget approved by the City Council. And with that, um, Tammy, John, and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions or comments by my colleagues? Great job. Councilwoman Gallego. Thank you. I think it was a very successful event. I agree with the Arizona Republic. They were ready to do this again. Um, a lot of lessons learned that I think will also apply to smaller events if we wanted to do them in the downtown area. Uh, one that was in the packet that we didn't talk a lot about today, but that light rail did hit its higher stay record ridership, and I think that was very exciting. I believe we could not have done Super Bowl Central mm -hmm. without our light rail system. Mr. Chair, uh, Councilwoman Gallego, I will tell you that the um, NFL was a little skeptical of light rail because they had had a they had past experiences, I won't get into where, that perhaps public transportation did not meet the objectives that were just expected. Um, they walked away astoundingly supportive of our community and our light rail and stated that light rail made a fundamental difference in the success of the event from their perspective and their um, confidence in Super Bowl Central and downtown Phoenix was in no small part related to the transportation uh, both uh, uh, and parking opportunities that were made available uh, because of light rail um, being an asset that both brought people here and brought parkers from out on the light rail line into downtown. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had the pleasure of visiting the Emergency Operations Center, which was a very impressive coordinating center. And the number one problem the city was facing at the moment was too many people on light rail. So that's as problems go, I think that is a good one. Um, I think overall an extremely successful event. I still wish we'd done a little bit more communicating with commu about street closures. I think people were fairly aware that Washington was likely to, within this area, fairly aware that Washington was likely to close on Saturday should we not have a terrible monsoon at the time. And I wish we'd told people a little bit more about what to going, was going on so they could expect it. I think people did not fully understand exactly how slow traffic would be in the downtown. So. That is my one area where I, I do wish we had done more communication. Uh, we'll, we will work to improve that for the next time. Thank you. Councilman? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just want to make a, a quick comment. Uh, you know, I had heard a lot of skepticism before uh, the event happened uh, from people in the far areas on traffic and cost, and it was, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will tell you, since then, I have heard nothing but positive reviews. Yeah, there was traffic, but they got down here and they had a great time. So it took them a little longer to get home, but they didn't care because experience was worth it. Um, I, I have heard so much positive uh, from the community uh, businesses. I, I just want to tell you, you did us proud. And we really, really appreciate it. I know everybody put in a lot of extra time, a lot of extra effort, and it showed. I mean, it was a first class act. I don't care where you were in this world, Phoenix was shining bright. The only question I have had from people is, how did she stay on that tiger's back and how did his legs move? <laughs> <laughs> that was the big question, but everybody else, thank you, thank you, thank you. Councilman? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would echo everything that uh, Councilwoman Williams and Councilwoman Gallego said. I mean, it's just been nothing but positive comments from everyone who's who's come up to me afterwards. I had the opportunity as well to go out to the Emergency Operations Center, and that was just amazing. So I tip my cap to the police and fire and the coordination, the, the feds who were there were talking about unprecedented cooperation. They've never seen anything like it in any other region. So that's a great story, and it's good that people didn't hear about it. Um, you know, obviously that was a positive, but that was great work they were doing behind the scenes. And who would have thought that we've struggled for years and been scratching our heads on how do we deal with all this vacant space downtown. <laughs> but thank goodness we had Block 23 as vacant space. So, uh, you know, um, it, it worked out great. And, um, uh, and then finally, I'd like to, and I raised this before, uh, have us look a little bit at, when you're looking at those numbers specifically, how much of that was driven by the fact that we had open container situation downtown um, because I do think um, that that played a, actually a very positive part in what happened and that we ought to look at that as a city is that something that we would be interested in doing maybe you know there might be two or three events a year that that makes sense to to do the the open container a situation as really a, a benefit um, for for downtown Phoenix thank you Thank, thank you. That's all great points. Uh, I mean, wh wh what can I, I, I echo the comments and there's so much more to be shared. Public Works did such a great job. It was in the video of giving people the option. If you just give the people the option to divert waste, uh, you know, they will take it. And that was one of the first things I noticed. And, and a lot of people were, were talking about things like open container. Uh, look, at the end of the day, we, we, are, uh, we have a fiduciary responsibility to the people of Phoenix, so we need to know exactly what the numbers are, okay? It's great to know that we are within budget, but we need to know exactly where the numbers are. I will say, though, some of these things are, you know, at the cost of, this is just the cost of doing business. We, you know, people walk away, and it was mentioned, it's expected that 2015 is gonna be a big year for the convention center. And so will 2016 and on and on. People are, uh, are excited about Phoenix. And, uh, you know, ask the small business owner who owns a coffee shop or the hot dog stand what the Super Bowl did for them and the people that they employ. Uh, the, you know, the hotel industry thanks all of the collective efforts of the Super Bowl host committee and every employee and every volunteer. Uh, it was just, it was a great, event for all of us uh, multiple times my daughter joined me she's 20 years old and we were walking down i remember so several times we we came out and checked out the activities in downtown phoenix she's 20 years old and she's looking around and she tells me this is really good for our city uh -huh. you know and if, and if this can resonate with a 20 year old young lady you know think about it think think of what was just accomplished uh, i also had the uh, the, the privilege of serving as a firefighter during some of the, the times. And uh, on game day, after the game, everything is, is done. And our public safety, our first responders, both police and fire, multi-agency, you know, the feds and everyone else involved, it was, it was mentioned, everyone working together. There's so much work that's been put into it, obviously, whether you're a first responder or not. Every, you all know what we're talking about, right? We all rolled up our sleeves. 
uh, and there was this feeling after the game when the stadium is clearing out and, you know, everyone sort of immediately had, and you know what I'm talking John is shaking his head. Immediately you have this, this post Super Bowl, the post Super Bowl blues kind of thing, you know, there's just so much excitement, so much good stuff. And it's like, so the, the video, you know, the video is great. Uh, uh, and, and I think that also sells Phoenix. So great thinking, Tammy, great thinking on all fronts, just the way we market it and uh, just very, very exciting. So, you know, that said, you know, that what a great note to end this meeting on. I think we have a couple more uh, housekeeping items, but if we have no further items, we will move on. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, next is call to the public. We don't have anything there. Future agenda items. I do have one that I mentioned. You know, there are all, all uh, these plans, the, my plan Phoenix and, you know, complete streets and everything else. Can we get uh, uh, maybe an informational item on how they all work together as it pertains to development in downtown? Phoenix for this subcommittee. I know that it's that information is probably very valuable for several other subcommittees as well. But as this would pertain as it would pertain to the uh, to the development, I think we should kind of see how all of these things work together and maybe the progress um, as we move forward. Any other suggestions? In combination with that, could we have a couple of the downtown organizations? who are talking about ways to implement that plan come and describe what they're up to? Absolutely. Thank okay. You. Good. All right. Hearing no, no or other future agenda items, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah.